Why hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 611, that is 611, 611 of the Agostino Zynga show, hope you're doing well wherever this show may find you, I hope you are doing well, how am I? Pretty good all things considered, got me Carmex, got me headphones, got me glasses, got me mic and we're ready to roll ready ready to roll it's actually pretty good that carmax has the logo on both sides so anywhere you show it the logo is always showing it's like the best version of a box logo right maybe you should wear that as a box logo bit naff i know but maybe that should be the one right a little bit of carmax there but yeah big up everybody that's tuning in do appreciate every single one of you that do tune in every week um your dedication to listening to my dumb opinions is well and truly appreciated but yeah, let's run into the show. Let's waste no more time. So first things first, our star striker, star young striker coming up, Mason Greenwood, has been remanded in custody uh, because of some very icky and disturbing allegations. And it wouldn't normally be something I'd highlight on this channel because I don't really you know, want to get involved in all this sort of nonsense. But the stark contrast of what Mason Greenwood is currently going for or currently going through sorry and what happened the other night with Bakayo Saka at the Ballon d'Or where he essentially won the Young Player of the Year award and at one time both of these players were con you know compared to each other as some of the you know brightest young prospects coming out of England uh, people especially on social media especially because you know United and Arsenal have a really deep rivalry were basically arguing the points of either player and saying which one they think is going to end up being the quote-unquote star boy of their generation and now Mason Greenwood is essentially um, pending the trial like I'm assuming on his way to prison or if not his reputation is still going to be sullied off the back because even if he ends up playing football his public reputation is basically going to suffer and he most likely would never play for England again because of the PR nightmare around his name and but Kyle Saka is just going on from strength to strength he finished second in the Young Player of the Year um, nomination was it second? No, it wasn't second, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm lying. He finished eighth, but he was still ranked in the top 10 of the rankings and he was still there, you know, in the kind of celebrations and clearly it shows he's a talent that's kind of regarded amongst all the elite players out there. So clearly he's doing something right in that regard and, you know, looks amazing out there doing his thing with some of the um, Arsenal women's players and generally looking like an absolute boss out there. So break up a kind of sucker. But the story of Mason Greenwood is really the perfect kind of summation of wasted talent and i think it's a movie right what is it? i think it's um bronx tale isn't it that quote of wasted talent that is nothing worse than wasted talent and i tend to agree with that because i remember growing up in an area where a lot of people would talk about their dreams and aspirations of leaving the hood their dreams and aspirations of living like a poverty stricken area where i kind of grew up where literally people were kind of you know rubbing two pennies together to make sure they had enough money to put the electricity on or, or cut out randomly you had enough not enough money for gas or you couldn't pay for bread and all this sort of madness right so pure pure poverty going on around you but because you're all going through it you didn't really recognize it at the time i know i didn't it was only really when i got older and i started to make my own money I started to realize how poor we actually were but at the time I didn't really know because you're having you know you're basically having fun as a kid you're going out all the time if you don't have any food your your parent your the parents of other kids will feed you and you don't really see anything wrong with it because you're your friends but then later on you think rah Ted they must have saw that I was flipping my cheeks were hollowed out that my bed or must have heard my belly rumbling and basically you know felt pity on me and decided to kind of feed me but at the time you're happy just to get free food so it's kind of that bleak but usually a lot of people in my hood a lot of people in the area that I grew up would kind of look at music and sports as an avenue to get out. And the great thing about England, even though we're probably football focused as a main thing, there's a lot of avenues in terms of becoming professional in cricket, becoming professional in rugby, in tennis, in athletics. Even though they don't pay that well, you still have the ability that if you're blessed with some sort of physical attributes or you're a hard worker, you are kind of got, you have got the privilege or no, you have got the opportunity to basically try to take that career full time and obviously you've got stuff like martial arts you've got stuff like boxing and all, any other combat sport included also and that was always kind of a good route for a lot of people to kind of essentially pull themselves out of poverty single-handedly and pull their family along with them kicking and screaming and it was always great to see people from the hood basically make it you know um in in their kind of life in that regard one person who you know i kind of was uh, friendly with and went to school with when i was younger was mark noble the former captain and west ham legend who retired 
retired actually last season um, off of the back of uh, being released from West Ham. He decided not to kind of continue his career because he wasn't going to get a contract extension and decided to retire at the top of his game, a real, real solid pro. And he was somebody that was professional and a few other people too that ended up being professional in sports. So it's a big deal. And I'm assuming other parts of England too, because, you know, uh, Mason Greenwood wasn't from London. I'm not sure if he did grow up poor or rich. It doesn't really matter. But still, the fact that he was a mixed race kid growing up in the UK um, and he's been able to, you know, he's been blessed with a gift to play football and be able to be really, really good at it also to the point where he was playing in the first team at a really young age um, on the cusp of becoming, you know, one of the next big or one of the next England greats. And then he essentially kind of threw it all away um, due to whatever he got up with with his misses. But it's a bit of an interesting case because he was accused of what he was accused of first time around. Then he got placed on some, then he got placed on bail. So then he was released on bail with some conditions and I guess he broke those conditions and that's why now he's in prison basically until his trial date. Um, so he essentially shot himself in the foot before the trial even starts because I'm assuming this won't look good when the trial starts either that he broke the terms of his bail especially considering the severity of the crimes but anyway it says Mason Greenwood remanded in custody after court appearance the Manchester United footballer Mason Greenwood will spend um, more than a half would spend more than a month in custody after a district judge denied him bail on charge of attempted R word and other offences the 21 year old appeared at Manchester Salford Magistrates Court on Monday charged with attempted R word assault and repeatedly engaging in coercive or controlling behavior so i'm not too sure if the if the breaking of bail had to do with something with this because there was a story that came out the other day that said that him and the girlfriend who accused him of what she accused him of had started refollowing each other on social media i'm not too sure if that was true because a lot of people they'll put out those fake stories where maybe two people didn't didn't follow each other in the first place or they didn't unfollow each other then someone will post the, the screenshot of them following each other online and it makes it look like it was an action that they discovered so i'm not too sure if it actually happened but let's just take it you know at face value it continues that he wore a gray hoodie white t-shirt and gray jogging bottoms and gave his full name date of birth and address before district judge mark hadfield greenwood arrived in court in the prison van after spending two nights in police cell following the decision to charge him on saturday night his barrister david toll asked the judge to allow Greenwood to be released on bail. However, the judge remained, um, sorry, remanded the football in custody until his next court appearance in five weeks' time. So he's going to spend at least five weeks in jail. This young football player who should be on the training pitch right now, training and doing one two to Cristiano Ronaldo, is now in jail pending, obviously, his court case. Absolute waste of talent, absolute waste of opportunity. What a, what a, what a sad, sad way to end this story. It continues, Green, and I say end the story, but he won't. It, the story won't be ended because you know, when it comes to sports, especially football, if you've got a talent, and especially if you've been released and you're basically, you know, you've kind of served your time, there's always a football club willing and ready and willing to take you back up again and sign you because there's the amount of money on the line for football because he's very talented. So if he played for a flipping championship or a League One team, he could essentially get them up the league single handedly by scoring loads of goals or being very creative and providing loads of chances and stuff and assist. So. The, you know he's he, his value to those kind of clubs who don't really care about PR is insurmountable especially when they think about it. look when it goes back into history books no one's going to remember what you got charged with. they're just going to see that we got promoted you know two years in a row and something so there'll be plenty of teams queuing up if United do end up releasing him off of the back of the trial but I'm not too sure if he ends up being found not guilty I'm assuming they're just going to keep him anyway but if he gets found guilty then I'm sure they're going to you know his, his contract will be terminated he continues he's next due to appear in Man United, uh, Manchester sorry Mill Hall Court um, on the 21st of November the defendant's legal team told reporters they would be submitting a further bail application Greenwood's family sat in the public gallery on the small court alongside of members of the press. Rebecca Markowski Addison, prosecuting, told the court Greenwood has accused of attempted R word, the complaint on 22nd of October 2021. He also charged with repeatedly engaging in coercive and controlling behaviour. Greenwood is accused of monitoring the complaint on social media accounts and making threats and derogatory comments towards her and amounting to a serious effect upon her. Greenwood faces a third count of assault, okay, um, okay, accusing, what's that? Occasion actual body harm in December 2021 so just recently last year the end of last year he was still kind of hollering at her and doing all this on nonsense god almighty he was surrendered his passport to police as part of the bail conditions at a hearing earlier which included an order that he must not contact the complaint her parents or friends Jan Porter, the Deputy Chief Crown Prosecutor of the CPS North, said the Crown Prosecution Service reminds all concerned, all concerned that criminal proceedings against the defendant are active and that he has a right to a fair trial. Um, it is 
extremely important that there should be no reporting, commentary or sharing of information online that would in no way prejudice those proceedings. Complete opposite of what they do in the States, isn't it, right? <laughs> this is all done kind of behind closed doors, uh, cloak and dagger type of vibe, very private until the, the ruling. But in America, all that news ends up kind of leaking to the press. Greenwood, once considered one of the most um, talented England forwards of his generation, has not played or trained with Man United since our arrest 10 months ago. Nike ended the sponsorship deal with him and Electronic Arts removed him from the active squads on his FIFA 22 game. May United said May United would note that criminal charges have been brought against May Greenwood by the Crown Prosecution, who remained suspended by the club pending outcome of his judicial proceedings. Greenwood made his England debut the European National League game against Iceland in 2020, age 18. England debut at 18, clearly on the cusp of greatness. Now, the question I have for this is that what would you rather? Would you rather be a waste of talent or would you rather just never actualize your talent? One waste of talent means that you have a run. You have a short period of time where you get to enjoy the fruits of your talent as Mason Greenwood did. Let's say he enjoyed the fruits of his talent, you know, um, for like five years, let's say, yeah, in, in the kind of adult e type vibe in terms of going to clubs, instead of having attention to people, in terms of getting loads of money, in terms of sponsorship, in terms of clout, in terms of recognition from other professional players. He maybe enjoyed it for five years, maybe less, maybe three. Would you rather have that three years be legendary, something you will never forget, or just never have actualized any talent and just live a kind of basic normal life? What would you prefer? I'm not too sure if it was me. Maybe, I think if it was me, I prefer just to live a regular life, work a nine to five, have a family, chill at home, and just be a regular dude living a regular life and not involved in any kind of sports or any kind of entertainment, any showy thing, never. Because I can't imagine how heartbreaking it must be when you know you had something, a golden ticket basically, Right. Um, you had the, what, what's that? What's Brennan say? Brennan Schaub says um, you had the golden ticket to Willie for one contraction or whatever nonsense. Right. You had you literally were blessed with a once in a million opportunity that not many people get and that you squandered it. That would you know, that, that kind of regret is something I could never live with. So I'd much rather just live a regular, boring kind of life as a normie, as a civilian, as a, as a fucking comedian, say, and be content with that. You know, family, wife, um, whatever, kids, dog, whatever, car in the driveway, um, one holiday, a flipping year, maybe a couple of dinners out, some drinks with the lads, nice and chill, as opposed to, you know, being that guy in a bar that's always telling people, oh, I would have been on TV if it wasn't for my knee. I would have been this if I didn't do this that no I could never do that I could never ever do that so you know it is what it is it is what it is when it comes to that guy next on the list we got this pretty cool news there's a nightclub in London that's actually in a public restroom it's pretty cool it kind of reminds me a little bit of Golden Gate in Berlin there's a venue in Berlin called Golden Gate that has that's kind of like a public toilet but not really it's based it looks really it doesn't look like a club at all it's kind of really behind these weird spray painted doors and it's basically down some stairs and it's really small and this place in short it kind of reminds me of it and it says the following nightclub uh public sorry another nightclub public life hosted and a former public toilet is reopening as the warner the warmer room as you can see here, I pass this quite often when I'm cycling and whatnot. And it's a really cool little spot because this is basically Spitfield's market behind it where all these little cool little stores are and stuff. And just around the corner is Brick Lane and a few other cool stores as well. This is kind of like the main kind of trendy area of flipping East London. And there's this cool little venue here just there, you know, just downstairs for more public toilets, but it's turned into a room. And it's really small. I think it maybe fits about 100 people. Uh, but it continues. It says here, the shortest venue has been shut since 2012. Um, the venue, which was closed since 2012, is located in the old decommissioned public toilet. It was originally open for a six-year run Run and hosted parties such as Secret Sundays. Since then, the space has been largely unused. It's an intact. It has an intact Function One sound system that can fit eighty people. Rotted. Right There's a Function One sound system just sitting there, dormant, not being used. This is the issue with London, isn't it? We have a lot of cool spaces actually, but they don't get used. There's loads of maybe restrictions placed on them, um, and they're just laying there vacant. Like that could have hosted so many interesting and cool parts. Maybe it has on the sly, like little undercover ones that I don't really know about, which I doubt because that area is pretty bait. So if it was happening, neighbors would complain, but still cool to see. It says on November, November 4th, the club will reopen as a warmer room, spearheaded by London promoter, the warmer people, AKA Tom Grant, Nathan Collin, Collin, Collinant, uh, Giamaco Giraldi. 
Their first party will feature a headlining set from Leo Paul. The event is free with the RSVP here. Future nights will happen on a monthly basis. And it says a quote from the people involved. We're keeping it the same as before, but with a new generation of DJs, we want to keep it inclusive, create an enjoyable atmosphere and do it in a cool location. So yeah, really looking forward to that. It should be a cool little space to go to. There's not many clubs in that area. I don't think there's one. No, there's there's obviously um, 93 feet east, I think around the corner and um, Cafe 1001 actually. But in terms of music, they're all kind of the same in terms of what people play. It's a little bit tech house, it's a little bit bait, it's a little bit commercial. So if they can have like a kind of, you know, an alternative place where you can maybe hear people that are going to really, really be digging into their bags and stuff and playing some actual sick tunes and it's going to be a far more, you know, discerning um, customer base and punters out there who want to hear certain people play in such a small room because I imagine it's going to be quite claustrophobic in there um, with all the equipment and people running around and shit it's not going to feel the most you know free and open to kind of swing your arms around and dance like no one's there but still being on top of each other and pounding like that I love places like that I love sweatboxes like that so I'm definitely going to be checking it out um, on November 4th this new place called The Warmer Room and I think they've got a little page open now where you can sign up and get all these RVCPs obviously it's closed now so you can't do it now um, so boohoo if you didn't sign up already but I'll be there reporting back of course on the podcast when I do end up going there I cannot wait I cannot wait Next on the list here, moving on, we have this news courtesy of Mixmag regarding Leeds Mint Warehouse first Leeds venue, Mint Warehouse, uh, banning flash photography on a dance floor. I personally think this is hilarious because in general, I've mentioned it plenty of times, especially with my obsession of going to Berlin, that for whatever reason, the UK and London specifically, we have a really hard time kind of understanding the idea behind door picking, the idea behind nope, not allowing people to take pictures and whatever. People feel, I don't say they feel entitled to it, but people feel a little bit like if I give you money as entry, if I give you money to come into this place, then I can do the hell what the hell I want to do. Which is probably why people in London, especially, you see a lot on the dance floor. People are taking bumps and stuff on the dance floor, doing lines off their phone. Like I mean, not giving any real care of the space they're in and what that kind of gesture, what that kind of action may do for the overall kind of success of the club, right? Because you don't know if maybe you're doing those bumps and there's a secret police there, they might see you doing it. And then that might go as kind of in a complaint and who knows later on the fucking license of the place gets taken away. So you maybe have a little bit of consideration and just go to the toilet. Everyone else does pretend you're going to do a shit and do as much as you want. But people in London don't give a crap. They just do it on the dance floor. So telling people not to not take a picture is insane because people take drugs on the dance floor. So imagine trying to tell them not to touch their own phone on the dance floor. It's not going to happen. So some places do do it. Um, the ones that are a little bit more, I'd say appealing to a niche crowd, maybe a lot more those kind of te techno heads that you'd see on TikTok who kind of dance like that, right? And wear fucking go faster glasses and all black. They kind of understand it, but general punters don't get it. They don't get it at all. I, c I can't imagine trying to do a no picture thing in fucking, you know, I don't know. What's that place called in Manchester? Warehouse, right? The, that, that place, right? Imagine trying to do it there. Those kind of big, massive kind of commercial places. It's just not going to work. So um, big up Leeds Mint, first of all. Mint Leeds Mint Warehouse, sorry, for trying at least. Big up them for trying. So this article says as follows. Oh, look at the venue. looks amazing. I want to check that out. Little lights on the top of it. I love stuff like this, man. It makes you feel like you're on some Gaspar Noir film or something. It says here, an unwritten rule of dance floor is now back. Uh, is now in black and white at Leeds. Oh, what are they trying to say? Black and white. Why is black come first? I'm joking. <laughs> at Leeds Mint Warehouse after the 750 capacity venue. Jesus Christ. How are you going to police? Anyway, let's see. Um, venue introduced a new policy banning flashing photography on the dance floor flash photography announcing a new rule on instagram yesterday wednesday 12th mint warehouse told club goers we won't be banning the use of phones completely but as a minimum we ask that no flash be used on the dance floor which i agree with i think there's nothing more distracted nothing more of a vibe killer if vibe killing is somebody being excessive with the searching outside in the front of the door then you have to admit that vibe killing is also having a group of girls like smiling and taking a million fucking selfies it's already bad enough with the front 
flash thing on the screen it catches your attention but the light on the fucking cameras now because usually these cameras i guess because of people going to festivals or people just taking more pictures with their phone every iphone or most smartphones have really decent flashes or they can take really good photos in low light you know the, the, the flipping lens opens up there's more eye you know the iso flipping thing goes really high you can use a flash on top of it so it can shine really bright and it can take a pretty decent picture at night or in a club or whatever it may be so the light is bright you ever try to use a fucking flashlight when you lost something think in a club or somewhere dark you'd know how fucking bright the light is or the torches on the phone so when people are out taking pictures on the dance floor it's really distracting and a complete vibe killer and takes you away from where you are and usually like most people i think out there if someone next to you pulls out their phone and starts doing something you automatically tilt play your phone too it's a reflex it's like when someone yawns you end up yawning as well um so that phone thing can take you out of the moment and also make you concerned about maybe taking a picture too to document it and it's always interesting because the people that take the most pictures i don't even think they even look at them they take loads of pictures they video loads of shit but do they even look at that footage again the next day probably not it's just kind of like done just to kind of do it for the sake of it so this is the sign they've got their flash um off on the dance floor cool little sign there obviously with the iphone so it's clear what they're meaning there and a thank you and it continues um the the yeah, it says here, the, 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 the comment on the actual post on Instagram says as follows, the caption, phone policy at Mint Warehouse. We appreciate the evolving side of social media means that the f use of phones is so prevalent and regular in our day-to-day -day lives. We're asking for those to, to reduce the use of phones in the club. It's time we can switch off and be present. Of course, I've never, it just, I treat it similar to when I go gym. When I go to the gym, I just put a playlist on and don't touch my phone again. I want to be locked into what I'm actually doing, even if it's for like 20 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour. Let me do some locked in for that one hour a day and then i can get back on my phone and do whatever nonsense i want to do it continues here it says no flash we won't be banning the use of phones completely um the, the use of flash for us is an absolute vibe killer the last thing you want in a rave is a huge flash coming off um someone's phone and ruining the vibe for everyone please help us roll out this new policy by kindly asking anyone with their flash on to switch it off agreed and that always always what it takes it takes the convenient policing i always share this story about my first time going to Bergheim, and you know i wasn't I didn't know anything about the club and I come from London. So I have that London mentality of doing fucking drugs on the dance floor, breaking up appeals on the dance floor and then dabbing it really baitly, doing Ken Coke on the dance floor, really baitly on the dance floor. Um, and then obviously when I was about to do it in Bergheim, I think I was in Panorama Bar, I literally pulled out my baggie about to take the key and do the bump. Some r random dude just came, hey, 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 no, no, we don't do that here. Go to the toilet. We don't do that here. No, 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 no. we don't do that here. I was like, oh, shit. I didn't know. Got my eyes all wide-eyed because I was obviously yacked out of my mind anyway. I was like, oh, shit, I had no idea. Then obviously went to the toilet and the first thing you hear when you're in the fucking cub cubicles queuing up is obviously the, the, the fucking beats outside, but you hear loads of... And um, I mean, in the whole cubicles, everyone's fucking sniffing or giggling or doing some sort of nonsense. So I clearly recognize, okay, cool. This is where people leave all that kind of stuff. And the dance floor is meant for dancing. Don't disrespect the space. And it was a lot. And just again, it was a random person. They didn't work there, just a random raver. And they come up and said that to me. So that's what it takes. It takes that kind of self-policing to kind of get that stuff right. So people have to kind of, in a way, turn into drug narcs. It's not the most accommodating thing. So it's not the most... um. It's not the coolest thing to be, right? It's kind of corny, kind of lame, but you have to turn into a drug narc if you want to keep these spaces open and take, you know, make sure they don't face any potential of closure because if somebody does file to enough complaints about people doing drugs and doing antisocial behavior stuff, these places can shut very quickly. We know how the UK is when it comes to dealing with any of these kind of issues. They don't deal with them. They just respond with closing. So hopefully this works for this place. Um, the new policy comes into effect on so October 21st at Mint's next event, the Garage People Party. Party headlined by Sammy Virgie. Good luck trying to tell garage pe garage fans <laughs> not to take um, pictures with flash cameras on the fucking dance floor. But I hope hope it can work out. Um, it says the Midwest adds to a number of UK venues better photography for flash photography on the dance floors, which include the likes of Fabric, Fold, and Phonix and Glasgow. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, I didn't know Pho Phonix also bans photography on the dance floor. I didn't know that. Um, that's cool. London's Fabric introduced a photography ban inside the venue last year, announcing we're introducing. Da, 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 da. we're introducing a strict no photo no video policy at the club say in the moment and put away the phone and join the night to be fair i have to say even though you do see people uploading videos and stuff from fabric and whatnot and i've taken the picture of a video myself on the sly overall 
this has definitely been a net positive for the club. It's far more enjoyable. I'm sure a lot of it has to do with the fact that they changed the booking policy anyway. So it's, there's a far nicer crowd in there. Um, there's better nights in there. The security on as aggro as before, even though they do search you like you're going through an airport when you go in there, you know, taking a picture, all that stuff is a vibe killer. But I have to admit, the photography ban does go a long way in terms of helping the vibe of fabric. It definitely has helped to improve it. So um, good luck to... Uh, to uh, Leeds Mint Warehouse um, or Mint, but the Mint Warehouse or Mint Leeds, whatever it's fucking called, I'm definitely going to check it out because it's got these LEDs that make it look like, um, what's that place in fucking um, Berlin that I said I liked? Uh, I forgot what it was called, but you know the one I'm talking about, that's when they plays in sometimes. So big up them, hopefully it works out. Hopefully it works out. Next on list, we're going to quickly talk about this. So this is a tweet that somebody shared oh yeah this is a tweet from business business teshno regarding the whole thing that's happened with asqueef uh, you know the founder of lobster ferryman who's going through a bit of a mad one in terms of him being accused of being a bit of a sex pest or being an abuser or being a harasser or whatever it may be by one of his um artists or former artists that was on a label who kind of came over from glasgow, was it glasgow or somewhere in scotland to kind of pursue her djing and production production career and then through whatever nonsense he decided that was opportunity to try a thing and it went really really badly and then of course she felt really uncomfortable and decided to move back and then basically expose and air him out for the nastiness that he allegedly did he obviously denies it said he didn't do it but still you know the narcissist is out there i remember mentioning before that the thing that annoyed me about that story was number one it sounded like the girl was all about herself right it sounded like she didn't really have much support um there was that whole clout thing as well about being afraid of speaking up because the person's really big and at the time Asqueef had just started or in the last couple of years Asqueef has just kind of blown up in terms of profile and he's now become really big off the back of his meme page that he has on Instagram that people follow and all this sort of stuff I think it's called Cat Squeef or something is it Cat Squeef? I think it's Cat Squeef so I kind of you know it's really sad to hear and heartbreaking because clearly this person felt like they had no way out to kind of speak about what happened until they obviously plucked up the courage to kind of speak about it but I was speaking about it and I was saying the thing that annoys me is that not her, more so the people around the scene who know of Asqueef personally, who know of that label personally, who've heard the stories, not saying anything prior. I think the lack of bravery of people, especially the ones in the industry, in the scene who know what's going on behind the scenes, but don't want to say nothing, essentially leads to victims like this having to suffer. They're the ones that suffer the most because they don't know. They're coming, you know, they're coming naively down, thinking this person's going to be professional, thinking that it's going to be this opportunity to pursue an interest that you want to do, especially if you know or like somebody's persona online. You just assume they're going to be cool. You come down with all the good intentions in the world and then you get taken advantage of and you get kind of caught off guard because no one has shared that news online or been honest and said, hey, this person's actually like this. Watch out for this, watch out for that. And if you get in business with them, it's up to you, but at least you're aware of what's happening was you, you know what you're kind of walking into and i mentioned in general that there's in general when i think when it comes to the scene especially in kind of dance music and nightclubs i think and dance culture or whatever it may be that i'm interested in or nightlife and clubs and stuff i feel like there's a real lack of bravery overall it's, except for the victims the victims are the ones that are always the bravest the ones that have the most to lose but when it comes to industry people who actually work behind the scenes it's truly disgusting and truly awful how few of them are willing to step up and speak up for things that they think are wrong and I said beforehand, it was really disturbing too, because I'd imagine, this is me just guessing though, but I'd imagine a lot of people who actually work behind the scenes, people who work for booking agencies, people, people who work for, you know, event production people, people who work uh, in management companies, people who work at record labels. I'd imagine there's a few number of girls there or a few number of women who have experienced and seen have come through everything. So these people hear stories. They probably had their own stories that they kind of had to combat or, you know, areas that they've grown up in where the abuse was maybe rampant and they had to kind of navigate out of it. But they know, they know what's going on. So in an industry that's full of, of loads of professional women working in the background to help, to, to help the industry keep chugging along for those people just to kind of remain quiet and not say anything um is really really horrible to be honest and again like i said the people that suffer are the potential victims that come in all naive and open-eyed um you know trying to pursue their dreams little do they know they're walking into a fucking snake pit and this is a good example of it with the jimmy asquee thing because now look people are sharing stories about him from 2019 about him being a little bit weird and stuff so you know it's just horrendous that these things don't get spoken about more openly or even more op maybe not openly to us in the pub but at least in the industry at least at events sharing with people or djs other people on the label and saying hey by the way keep your eye on this duh, 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 just so people are aware of what they're walking into but this 
screenshots courtesy of business Tesno. it says the following it's from a person called mitch lamb and they say this our crew can bear a house social book jimmy asque for a show in august um April, sorry in april 2019 what followed was the worst experience any of us can recall when dealing with a touring artist. As Creef got incredibly intoxicated during his set, acted inappropriately with several of our female crew members, even kissed a punter even though we understood he had a partner at the time. Jesus, the cherry on top of this bullshit behaviour was me getting a call at 4am from my local club to come and collect Jimmy from the bathroom as he'd K-holed himself. If you know anything about K-Hole, you know that he must have took a fair amount to, to go in the K-Hole. Usually, from my experience, you have to kind of be a bit excessive and not do him at kind of precise intervals for you to kind of go over the edge. And um, once you're in that K-Hole, it can be really kind of distressing at times, kind of scary, especially if you're in a nightclub, especially if you're intoxicated. So you can only imagine what condition he was in. And obviously, this is the picture and proof of the part yourself um, for anyone doubting. And it continues, it says, yeah, in the toilet cubicle and refused to come out. No shame on getting a bit ketty, of course, because we all do it. But, and, but by all reports, he was rude, aggressive to the venue staff when they checked in on him. He was so messy that taxis refused to collect him and he was being verbally abusive to our... Imagine being honestly, like... I always say it before, don't I? DJing is one of the best things i've ever done as a hobby and as a kind of semi-professional job thing right but obviously since the pandemic has closed and things have been open again since the pandemic has kind of quiet that's a bit open again my gigs have kind of dried up essentially and i'm just having to flip and stream stuff from pirate right kind of sad but hey make do what you got and i'm trying to pursue it now to to some degree but it's always distressing when you hear these stories because you think to yourself like these guys are so fortunate to be able to play for people who actually want to see them number one because i've still have not had that luxury most of the places i go and play in bars and clubs i'm just basically someone playing background music right people are just you know you're just trying not to annoy people and make sure that they buy drinks and stay yeah just that's all you're doing but no one's coming out to see you because you're not no no one gives a fuck about you you're not playing on big stages and whatnot so these people are playing in places where people are coming to see them they've got their names on big font in the flyers sometimes in bold sometimes at the top of the flyer People are paying money, tickets to come and see you. They're thinking about what to, what to wear to come see you. They're pre-gaming before to come see you. They're inviting friends to come and see you. They're making sure their phone is charged to come see you. All this stuff, taking time off work, uh, booking a nanny, blah, 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 blah. And then you go and number one, you get super fucked up, which I don't agree with. I've always approached DJing as a kind of thing of where I try to do them all, most of them sober, um, especially not drugged up. That's crazy. You can maybe have a drink, but doing drugs and stuff while you're playing just doesn't make any sense. Provide a really good show doesn't matter if you're playing for one person or flipping 100 so that people can feel like oh you put on a really good show i'd like to come see you again but it's all about being professional so they'd got that opportunity and instead of kind of providing a good show having a good time um even having a good relationship with the promoters right making sure that you're in the state to talk and communicate with the promoters and you know thank them for how for the opportunity to come down maybe share a word or two with some fans who come and see you whatever it may be just enjoy the moment soak it all in before you hop on another plane and go somewhere else you then go and do all this nonsense i never get it i really don't the ones who get all the opportunities always take it for granted it's really really shambolic and the thing that's really funny or really weird about it is that we all come from the same place it doesn't matter if you're a you know a really bait person like amelia the lens amelia lens sorry or a peggy Gu or charlotte the wit or sven var or whatever it may be called we all came from the same place we all came from a place of playing on belt drives on midi players on crappy cdjs you know on a flipping laptop whatever it may be and you start off small and you grow build slowly you build up but you always remember those terrible gigs where no one turned up where no one danced where people get asking for beyonce we all have to start from that kind of place so to start from that place and then get to the higher up places and take it for granted it's just it doesn't make any sense to me it's beyond it's beyond it continued um no shit we get da, da, da. the next slide says the uh, what's that sorry uh, let's continue there uh he was being verbally abusive to our crew as we tried to help him back to his room we finally managed to get him back to the hotel but i'm almost certain it's only because jimmy thought he was going to be able to sleep with one of our female crew members that was helping us walk him home that was definitely not happening and our female crew member was disgusted by his behavior once sucked into his accommodation he called us cunts and threatened to bash us all he then proceeded to miss his flight back overseas in the morning and had to cancel a panel appearance he was booked for that day we reported all his behaviour to the touring agency who booked us with and pledged we would never deal with him again. Sadly, we are not surprised by the reports of his grooming and inappropriate behaviour around women. Jimmy, if you are reading this, fuck you. Oh my God. 
<laughs> we still talk about this night to this day and about how much of a dickhead you are. You're not welcome back in Canebra. Good riddance. So again, this is the issue I have. No, why didn't you speak up about this at the time? I know you report this to the agency and stuff, but why didn't you share this thread at the time so that people were aware? Because this would have gone viral and that could have gone viral to the point where it was shared and kind of, you know, broadcast in the circles of whoever else would come down and want to join Lobster fucking Theremin and they could see, oh shit, this is what I'm dealing with. And then they could decide if they wanted to, you know, walk into a snake pit or not. But I just feel bad for the lady that, you know, was at the hands of him and suffered that abuse because essentially she had no idea. You're coming from a completely different place in, in the world. You don't know what's going on in our scene, intrinsic, like, you know, the, 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 in, the kind of, um, uh, not intrinsic, the, the kind of, you know, the, the minutiae of what's going on in the scene. You have no idea and you're just walking in kind of naive, hoping for the best and then you end up kind of meeting one of the worst people that you can meet as a first point of contact and then you're here alone as well on top of that it must be absolutely horrible and also have we heard anything officially from the back of this nothing about him about getting booked and stuff i checked his flipping ra recently actually the last appearance i saw was october something and that got cancelled um you know and again you know a local promoter had to get fucked over that because you know they put on the event you have to pay in terms of you know booking the venue or deposit you probably lose if you book it if you cancel a certain amount of time beforehand so you know everyone has to suffer off the back of sin again like i mentioned before the people on the label who had no idea what was going on or who are just working as artists they have to suffer too because that whole lobster frame and name has been kind of sullied off the back of this it's all nonsense and the thing that he could have done to be a real good head and a really good leader was just decide, hey, I'm going to back away from the label and write a statement where he's basically saying, hey, this label has nothing to do with me anymore. It's about these people, the representative of it. Don't associate my name with this. This is them. I don't want to kind of jeopardize their careers. I'm going to back away from the label and this person's going to take control of that. That person's going to take control of this. Um, please support as much as you can while I deal with this issue privately or through the courts. Something like that. But instead of any statement, he just kept fighting for himself, fighting for himself, kind of, you know, basically, um, you know, self-absorbed, narcissism, selfishness, whatever it may be cool but whatever it did it did kind of go a long way to show that you know that's that's the kind of minerals of somebody that would do the thing that he basically got a letter of you would imagine allegedly i don't know anything so don't come and sue me but you know what i mean right it's a distancing himself to the label at the first point of those allegations coming out so to give everybody in the label a chance to you know gather their thoughts and to think about what they're going to do and not put them in awkward position you don't you make it all about you and look at this just a random comment here from somebody says I remember reading a review of a show he played a few years ago where he K-holed on stage Dex went into emergency loop and his friend had to come on stage and try to mix for him while he was getting thrown out and I actually remember hearing this story about somebody else who did I hear this story about it must have been who did I hear it about I heard the story about somebody oh it must have been about Richie Ahmed or something one of those people I think it was him was it Richie Hamid? I don't know. Allegedly it was somebody. One of those people. Allegedly. I don't know anything. Don't kind of consume me for fucking defamation. I have no idea. I'm just talking about rumours I saw online. You know, I'm a nobody, please. Um, another one says, yeah, I know these are serious allegations, but I can't help but laughing at the Australian is offended by the word cunt. Who? He's going to still showing up at Belly London, but I'm so late this month too. Don't worry, Jack Master. Oh, okay. Don't want to talk about that one. Don't get other people in, but yeah, you know what I mean. Um, essentially, the the scene is really, really toxic. People don't speak up, and in the end, you know, innocent victims who come into the game, you know, innocent and don't really know what they're doing, don't really know the scene too well, are still navigating through it, and are kind of young in their career, have to suffer off the back of it. It's absolutely disgusting. But again, hopefully, justice will prevail, and something will happen off the back of that. You can only hope. You can only hope. Um, so. Moving on, this other video from Business Session made me absolutely hilariously laugh as I saw this earlier today. So this is a clip taken from a recent appearance from from a DJ called what's his name called Anurag Anurag right Anurag 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 uh, recently appeared on Boiler Room and decided to use his appearance on Boiler Room as an opportunity to speak for the issues he has with the platform in general and issues I've seen kind of been spoken about recently um, more often on Twitter and spaces where, you know amongst the techno Twitter crowd regarding Boiler Room and how they treat artists and DJs who come and perform on their platform and something I've, again I've only heard really spoken about in loud voices in the last year or so but I didn't really hear about much of it beforehand but the interesting thing to do right at the end of his DJ set that he's playing in this venue wherever he may be so big up Anurag for what he had to say let's play and put it up on the screen so you can hear i just wanted to ask you all some questions i think this is a really important cultural thing that we do that we gather and we dance um yeah do you all think this is important what we do coming together to do 
things like this. Also, anybody in the chat, feel free to answer. All right, I've got a question. Do you think it's important for artists to get paid for their work? I think everyone here is on the same page with that, and I think myself and all the other artists who are playing got a really generous fee, which is wonderful. Um, another question. Do you think exposure is an important, is an appropriate way to far pay artists for their work? A lot of no's in the crowd. Anything from the chat? Natalia Newling asked for a wave. What's up? Well, from 2012 to 2020, Boiler Room had a track record of not really paying artists. In mid-2020, they started to change that and paid everybody for all their shows, including this one. Um, but it's really important to think about who these corporations are owned by, that Boiler Room is literally owned by the elite of the elite, by venture capitalists, and by, you know, very rich, you know, young white entrepreneurs. And that, ultimately, they're the people who benefit from situations like this. So, I felt really conflicted when I was asked to play this. So if you haven't heard, he's basically speaking about um, this issue that people have been speaking about more often regarding Boiler Room and the practice of not paying DJs. They'd pay them with exposure. And this happens a lot in the creative field. It's not just exclusive to DJing. This happens in writing, happens in photography, happens in design, happens just being an influencer, just doing any kind of content work. Sometimes if you're on the come up and there's a platform that has a lot of um, cultural relevancy, they have a lot of clout, they have a lot of you know popularity behind them, people view and follow them because you want to get in front of that audience because you want to have the ability to maybe use that one opportunity to give you opportunity to get to the next level that you want to get to you'll sometimes do work for the exposure sometimes for the look for the association and it can be handy in the beginning it really can i know for me being a kind of you know um what would you call it being a short article writer for places like Hypebeast and wherever it is back in the day it was quite handy to do those first posts and stuff for free because doing those first posts for free that I did allowed me to then go and use that work to kind of get me more work in places like Sneak and Use and other places I was writing for for a short period of time while I was in uni trying to make some extra money and then when Hypebeast did end up making more money they ended up then started to pay us I think at the time when I was at Hypebeast they were paying us like 30 to 50 dollars per article or something like that so basically the more articles you, pay, you writ the more money you was able to make and big up Kevin Ma for just holding us all down and really being upfront and honest about the situation and what we could do in terms of going forward in terms of making the most and obviously covering all the important culture news and streetwear and beyond so it was pretty cool but the boiler room situation I've kind of been I'm always a little bit iffy about some of the criticism because for the longest time it was the only platform the only kind of premier live streaming platform for djs now there's many many out there right there's keep hush there's um horvis in berlin that i hope to get onto one day there's um there's one that i know of as well from a record store in london that's pretty popular people are doing there's many many platforms and of course if you want to also there's also opportunity if you're a dj coming up you can always book a room in pirate studios and live stream yourself off your phone from a webcam like i do whatever you may be so there's loads of opportunities now but back in the day when boiler room first started i was one of the people that kind of went to the first boiler rooms that they did i think that might have been like pickle factory back in the day in shortage if you know you know and um you know they had just had like a fucking towel on the back of the wall or something or flag it was filmed in a crappy webcam one kind of angle no multiple shots um in really dingy looking places and for the most part it was seen as opportunity to just get in front of more people it was never seen as this is a gig it was never seen as okay you need to get paid for this was more so okay they've got a platform they've got people that watch it it's getting brand sponsorship and stuff but most of the reason why we thought that didn't make sense to pay was because at the time it was small and that brand sponsorship you thought was paid paying for the fucking venue paying for the staff paying for the security guards whatever maybe the running of the event obviously when it started to get more popular and it started to get actual corporate sponsorship like ray-ban and alcohol beverage sponsors and shit i didn't understand this whole premise around it being just a look anymore because they're clearly getting sponsored to do like stages and do the programming for festivals or do the programming for nightclubs or they kind of got like a weird agency that's not really an agency and you know people are doing content for them they're using it and it's all these different things are happening you know the, the revenue ever you get from youtube all this sort of stuff is really strange so i never understood why that why they didn't get paid in the first place because obviously they're making enough money to do get paid but i think a lot of it had to do with the fact that no one was really putting pressure on them especially in public like i said before there's a real lack of bravery a, lo a real lack of cojones in the industry people don't talk about stuff because basically when it comes to clout 
And when it comes to industry things, you don't want to burn a bridge. So no one's willing to step out at the peak of uh, the peak of uh, the peak of boiler room and say, hey, this practice is awful and it's disgusting and it takes advantage and exploits artists. I'm going to speak up about it publicly, even if it means it might jeopardize my opportunity to get back on the show or to get back on the channel. I'm going to speak up for it because I want to make sure other people don't go through what I went through. Speak about it and then it changes. But people are not brave enough. So the people just quiet, DJs and artists, didn't speak about it that often or maybe it was spoken about in hushed terms. You know, I see people using asterisks to talk about Boiler Room on their social media. They don't want to get trolled or whatever, maybe or whatever, right? And then it kind of spirals into this situation where, you know, it kind of goes on for way longer than it probably should because this kid mentioned that it was from 2012 to 2020 that they did it. So only recently, only two years ago, they started stop the practice of not paying people and imagine what boiler room was two years ago it was still as big as it was now it was still breaking people's careers it was still getting sponsored and flew out to different places and whatnot so the fact that they weren't paying people just shows that it's them being scumbags and doing a dana white and basically not kind of respecting artists and their work as opposed to um, anything else but you also can know that because they're very much a i guess social media platform they're obviously they they kind of yeah, I feel like respond to those kind of things well. No, well, not well. They respond to those things. Any negative press, they usually kind of go a lot, go out of their way to try to make sure to correct it. So if someone would have spoken up earlier, they could have changed this much sooner. But it took a while and it eventually did change, whether or not it changed because they wanted to change it internally or because the pressure of DJs, who knows. But it's good to hear them talk about it. The only thing that's a little bit funny about this is that if you were a raver at this event, this is a real vibe killer. It's obviously a good thing that he did it right at the end of his set. You know, he respects his audience enough and he's enough of a pro, this person, to do it actually at the end of the set when he's kind of done and wrapped up or whatnot. But imagine being off your face on whatever and then hearing this guy try to articulate a pretty um, a pretty kind of interesting and nuanced point about Boiler Room and about how they treat artists to an audience of people who just want to rave. And I long believe, I think someone said it before, oh, online, so I heard someone say something like, the fans should be demanding more from these platforms. I think that's really entitled, really kind of um, entitled, arrogant, and just really lacking in self-awareness to expect punters who go out to these places, pay their money to go and rave, to fight and to kind of um, champion and to kind of uh, get them or protest for the rights of artists. It doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. Um, you're not going to get fans to boycott anything or anywhere, whatever it may be. Maybe fans of you, not fans of the overall platform, doesn't really make any sense. So this is something that artists should be fighting for off their own backs. But a lot of artists are self-absorbed. A lot of artists are self, self-involved. So maybe some of them did get paid. Some of them didn't get paid. And the ones that did get paid didn't care about the ones that didn't get paid. Simple as that. But then I guess it got to a point where everybody wasn't getting paid. And then finally they spoke up and now it's changed. So at least it's changed down there paying people but it would have been nice if they would have spoken up beforehand but that aside big up a new rag because his set is still online the one that he spoke about where he's kind of ranting at the end is still online here and the rant is for a lot longer than that clip is i think it looks like it goes on for about two minutes and it's still online too on the bottom website so this is an absolute boss move he's got balls of absolute steel that he would do that um, especially knowing he's in the actual party to do that knowing you're going to piss people off someone might boo they might throw a fucking restaurant at the back of your head and he still does it so that clearly shows that this guy has big balls has morals has principles and you know despite him getting paid and maybe he doesn't know you know there's a threat of always someone docking your pay or whatever it may be or this really setting you back in your career he didn't care he said it anyway and for sure this will end up benefiting loads of people coming up um, to end up doing this next people like myself who haven't been on there yeah we'll end up kind of you know um reaping the rewards of this because it means you'll be dealt with in a professional manner and you'll get paid and it won't be that much of an issue so big up a new rag big up a new rag big up a new rag moving on from that we have um to talk about where is it here can i find it yeah let's talk about this we need to talk about this quickly. So obviously everyone's kind of ranting and raving and getting upset and getting niggas in a twist over the Kanye West interview with Drinks Champs. I watched a little bit of it on live stream and spoke about it myself and my thoughts around it. And that weirdly enough, it was strange to see a black platform be okay with 
sort of platforming somebody who a lot of people would say is suffering from some sort of mental episode or whatever it may be, but they're okay to exploit the situation for their own personal gain because it's a black quote unquote owned platform. But then if you also go and do the same thing on TMZ, do the same thing on Ellen DeGeneres or anywhere else, people would be ranting and raving and making a point of it. So it's interesting, right? As long as we're exploiting our own people, it's okay. But if other people do it, it's not okay. Okay, cool. Got the message. But off the back of this, um, obviously people haven't responded the, the the best to it because, you know, Kanye being Kanye. And one point that kind of stuck out and really riled people, especially out there in North America or people who are just very passionate about the BLM situation was Kanye's comments about George Floyd and about the arrest and about the subsequent death and about everything else attached to it. And he had some very interesting things to say about it off at the back of him watching the Candace Owens documentary that tries to basically unravel some of the misconceptions they feel like behind George Floyd and behind that arrest and everything. And he spoke about it on Drink Champs and I'm going to give you my opinion on the other side. I, I watched the George Floyd documentary that Candace Owens put up. One of the things that his two roommates said was they want a tall guy like me. They want a tall guy like me. And the day when he died, he said a prayer for, you know, eight minutes. Mm -hmm. He said a prayer for eight minutes. They hit him with the fentanyl. If you look, the, the guy's knee wasn't even on his neck like that. When he said, mama, mama his, is his girlfriend. They said he screamed for his mama. Mama was his girlfriend. It's in the documentary. Now, Obviously, people have responded really negative towards that. But the, one of the surprising things that come off the back of it has been people basically attacking the host and one of them being Noriega and basically saying that he should have spoke up and checked, quote unquote, yay for his opinion, which is a weird thing in general to check somebody because of their opinion, to basically chastise them and tell them off like you're their daddy or something. It's really bizarre. And also, if you can remember, the beginning of this interview on Drink Champs is a really long disclaimer where essentially everyone associated with Drink Champs basically says, we gave this guy a platform and a microphone but everything he says here does not reflect what we do so clearly they have listened and watched the interview back realized he said some wild stuff but they're will willing to receive the hate or whatever it may be because the views will be outstanding at the time of it being deleted or privated actually oh that's the other thing too it got deleted and pulled down from youtube now some people are reporting that revolt took it down some people are saying youtube took it down we're not too sure but it's not there anymore so people have uploaded their own little bootlegs but the disclaimer basically made it seem like they had watched it you know kind of understood that it was going to be something that people wouldn't respond to the greatest and absolve themselves from it completely cool no problem but then to turn around and take it off the platform after you gave the person a platform is after you gave in the person the platform to speak on your thing is a little bit weird and a little obviously pussy to do that kind of thing because if you want to kind of you know swim in the Kanye West um, pool of controversy to gain clicks and to gain engagement you have to understand that you're going to be you know dancing with the devil and dancing close enough to the fire to get burnt you get burnt but obviously you're doing it over the back of trying to make sure that you get views and engagement so you can't then turn around and suddenly be the moral police and somehow kind of apologize so Norega's gonna they do an apology tour whatever going back to your statement I find it really interesting no one obviously no one jumped in but the thing that really jumps out to me is the fact that he legitimately thinks this is Kanye yay he legitimately thinks a documentary is fact and I think a lot of people do this right a lot of people watch documentaries or this Jeffrey Dahmer series now on Netflix and they never t and they for some reason think because it's been dramatized or because it's been presented in a cool way with these cool graphics and these documents that you can't read online and these accounts of people who are, so who are there at the, at the time and blah 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 that somehow this is a bona fide fact of everything that happened and it's not it's a dramatization these things are made for tv um these things are made for your entertainment they're meant to grip you they're meant to entertain you they're meant to inform you in a little bit but obviously hold your attention so the fact that people like Kanye can watch a documentary and decide that your entire view of what you saw with your own eyes is changed and completely kind of been shooken up really does disturb me because all it takes is a couple of clicks online a couple of you know searches and you can find the truth for yourself the first one being you know the cause of death that being the big issue at the time when it happened with George Floyd passing um you know of the from the back of flipping police brutality we all were aware that he had some pre-existing issues right in terms of his drug abuse and whatnot no one was out there saying this guy was a saint no one was out out there saying this guy was martin luther king no one he wasn't malcolm or anybody the thing that was unfair about it was just the fact that we saw this man be arrested for something innocuous and then be 
and then see basically his life being extinguished in a matter of minutes that's what was basically unfair about the whole situation it didn't make any sense and then we knew especially with him being a big intimidating quote-unquote looking black dude that it only happened because of what he looked like and obviously off the back of all the other issues with police brutality in the united states it was just a it was basically the final nail in the coffin or the final kind of you know light to kind of start the fire whatever the fucking saying is i don't really know but whatever it is it was a thing that kind of got things it, it, it tipped the, the, the scales it made everything horrible and then people just decided to go crazy but no one was saying this guy was a saint it was just the fact that he life was basically extinguished in front of our eyes for an innocuous issue and it was so brutal so callous so lacking humanity it just tugged at all our heartstrings but obviously the, he had some sort of drug issue we knew this we knew he wasn't a fucking you know he wasn't out there fucking um teaching calculus in some sort of school but if you do a couple of searches online you'll see that the contention around his cause of death was something that a lot of people were talking about at the time and it was something that we were all kind of aware of um in general so this is the uh, article courtesy of new york times the so george floyd's cause of death is crucial in trial forensic pathologists explain um da, 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 da. and if you scroll down you say uh is there a way to one cause of death, right? And it says here, when someone dies, a death certificate is filled out for both public health and legal reasons. The form includes a cause of death in the first section and contributing factors in the second section. We usually have to come up with one cause, says Dr. Judy uh, Milinek, a board certified forensic pathologist. Everything else significant that might be wrong with a person is contributing. Pathologists describe the cause of death as an immediate injury or disease that leads to death. It is the disease or injury which starts the lethal sequence of events without an intervening cause what is the manner of death the manner of death refers to the circumstances surrounding the death there's usually five choices a few jurisdictions include more natural accidental suicide homicide or undetermined homicide is more often described as death at the hands or of another or others a homicide is not necessarily a criminal homicides can be a matter of self-defense for example the courts not medical examiners determine that um da -da -da -da. and if you scroll down it says here Dr. Barker described uh, Mr. Floyd's death, um, uh, cause of death, as a cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating law enforcement subdural restraint and neck compression. So already you see the term here, neck compression. The manner of death he wrote was homicide. The use of the term ca um, cardiopulmonary arrest led to the public confusion because some people wrongly assumed it meant that Mr. Floyd had a heart attack. Cardiopulmonary arrest means the heart stops beating and the lungs stop moving, says Dr. Cyril Witch. Some pathologists say that do not include the cause of death because it's the describes all deaths. Dr. Baker also detailed other significant conditions, including pre-existing ones such as a severe disease um, of the vessels of Mr. Floyd's heart, which he wasn't aware of prior and also described the laboratory findings of the opioid drug fentanyl and methamphetamines in mr floyd's blood so he already had fentanyl and methamphetamine in his blood but kanye is saying they hit him with a fentanyl as if like the doctor the police officers had fentanyl covered in their over their gloves or they basically sneaked it under his nose as they were putting their knee on his neck horrendous not including those under the cause of death means including concluding that those were there before but didn't start lethal sequence of events so dr melenic listing them is meant to is meant to clarify what made Mr. Floyd more vulnerable to the cause of death, he said, not excuse it. Here, context matters. Dr. Barker told prosecutors that if Mr. Floyd had been found dead at home alone with no other apparent causes, they wrote, it could have been acceptable to determine that Floyd died of an overdose because of his over relatively high levels of fentanyl finding his blood collected in the hospital. Instead, recordings revealed both prolonged restraint of mr floyd just before the death also that he appeared agitated rather than lethargic which could suggest tolerance of a higher dose of fentanyl the drug typically causes you to become relaxed by contrast mr Malik said dr chauvin's defense attorney appeared to be trying to use their medical findings to convince the jury that floyd was essentially a ticking time bomb already so they're saying even though he was a ticking time bomb he wouldn't have blown up if that guy didn't put his knee on his neck that's essentially what they're saying in this regard. And there were two conflicting kind of reports from the doctors, right? Um, the autopsy signed, forensic pathologists no longer access their entire body, sometimes organs of the... Mr. Floyd's family hired Dr. Michael Baden and Dr. Alicia Wilson to perform a second autopsy. Autopsy, sorry. Both experts said the pressure on Mr. Floyd's neck and back during the restraint by the police led to him to die of asphyxia, a term Dr. Barker did not use in his official report. But before, between, the doc, bef, between the asphyxia and between the heart stopping and the lungs not moving and uh, you know the amount of fentanyl on him and the fucking knee on the back, it's clear to see 
those combinations kind of resulted in him unfortunately passing RIP. So to sit there and think a documentary is going to dispel the entire notion of what happened and what you saw with your own eyes is legitimately insane. And the fact that no one spoke up and said anything about it just goes to show the amount of influence and the amount of clout and the amount of kind of um, the, 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 the nature of Kanye's celebrity, of how much, you know, influence and reverence he commands in that room that even an issue such as frats so sensitive and so kind of um hot button topic and some things a lot of black people especially in america are really sensitive and passionate about for him to sit there and be able to kind of disparage that guy's legacy and that guy's name and to kind of you know essentially um you know stir up some uncomfortable feelings for his family and shit no one say anything goes to show how perverse and how annoying and how frustrating celebrity is because if that was anybody else on the podcast people would be screaming at you and check and quote unquote checking you or telling you to read read up on stuff or do your googles or whatever maybe you're insulting in jail kicking you off the pod but because it's somebody notable people entertain it and they kind of indulge it and i think even noriega said in one interview he didn't want to interject or correct Ye because he didn't want him to walk off and kind of cancel the interview so he was more worried about the views and the engagement than actually getting to the core of the truth or basically setting some things correct or you know protecting the feelings of the family wherever it may be the views were more important and off the back of that because the, the heat was so bad they've now deleted it I don't like that I, I didn't like the interview I didn't like how exploitive it was but if you're going to put it out put it out don't uh, promote free speech and be out there and say because it various times in the interview the guy's like oh yeah this is your platform you can say and do what you want yeah you feel comfortable to come here when you want if this is platform to say and do what he wants let him say and do what he wants then we can talk about it on the internet but then don't go and delete it because you're scared of the fucking response that you're getting them because it might be damaging it because that's the thing also let's bear this in mind they're not deleting this or taking this down because they feel morally like this is weird or whatever, or they've got a principle around it or whatever it may be, or some reverence or respect for the Jewish people. No, it's because it's going to hurt their pocket. If the JP Morgan Chase Bank could close Kanye's account 140 million in it, imagine what they could do to these guys if they own these platforms that they're fucking streaming on. Revolt's probably hosted on a platform that's owned by some Jewish person out there, so they probably put the call in. So this isn't even done with any form of respect, with any kind of real sincerity, with any kind of um, regret. Is done off the back of them being afraid that their bag is going to be affected. So they did it for the bag, they did it for the views, and now they're being scared and taking it down because they don't want it to hurt their further, you know, um, money making opportunities and whatnot. It's totally disgusting. It goes to show how slimy that whole thing is. He's being, and that's the thing he doesn't realize, Kanye. Um, he's being used by the likes of Candace Owens. He's being used by the likes of people in the right wing, Tucker Carlson, all these people. He's been used by his own friends in hip hop as well to get views and whatever it may be. He's just surrounded by people who don't necessarily have his best interests at heart. And on top of it, he's also a person who it looks like doesn't necessarily like people pushing back and asking him questions. Anyone that kind of debates him, anyone that kind of questions what he says or tries to tell him off or tries to check him, he pushes them away or fires them. So he only is surrounded by yes men or he's just on his own. So if it's not his people taking advantage of him, it's him pushing them away. So he's kind of in this kind of quagmire he's in. It's a bit annoying. It is what it is. But hey, I wanted to report on that because I thought that was a bit of an annoying situation to have been seen. Off of the back of that, I've got another topic to talk about that involves Kanye that I thought was fucking annoying. Was this article courtesy of the New York Times written by my best friend, Vanessa Friedman. The woman who was also responsible for trying to bury streetwear because she's obsessed with this idea about the return of tailoring, right? Which is a lot of things that a lot of people in fashion say, which I've always said is for me a dig whistle that basically says we want to get rid of black and brown people in the scene. Because ever since streetwear took over in what, 2017, 2016, depend on what year you want to say as maybe it's a collaboration with Supreme that kind of set it all off. There's been a, co I guess a... Um, there's been a coordinated effort, it feels like, by the people, the elites, or the, the people in the position of power in streetwear, in fashion, sorry, to make sure that the black and brown faces are somewhat stifled or kind of pushed out because they've had enough of all of us kind of, you know, essentially taking over Paris and making it all about ourselves and being the ones featured on certain websites and blah, 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 blah. It's really annoying. It's really disgusting. But I guess off the back of Kanye doing what he's doing and going on this flipping anti-Semitic bigotry tour press run thing he's doing, it's a bit easier to kind 
kind of get out there and kick him while he's down. But I feel like this is also really disgusting because essentially it's one person advocating for the firing of some person of another person because they don't like what they said and because they feel like that you know the company should basically have um the British community should have what do you think they, they should have a, a code of conduct or whatever it may be that, that they kind of agree with or something or ethics or whatever it may be it's, it's a strange thing I don't really like it so this is the kind of title currency of the New York Times it says can Balenciaga break with Kanye and it's essentially Vanessa Freeman putting pressure on Balenciaga to you know uh, uh, end their relationship with Kanye because I'm assuming she's Jewish herself so it probably hits home and also this is also a good way to in a way kind of trojan horse and get streetway the fuck out of here because she says streetway is dead it continues it says in all the noise that has been generated by uh by and about kanye or yeah as he's known over the last 10 days ever since the disrupted paris fashion week with the yeezy show then the disrupted um the show with the like, white lives matter t-shirt then embarks in a public flood of attacks against anyone who dared to criticize his message and then escalate to anti-semitic screeds on social media and fox news one voice has been particularly deafening in its silence you could say anybody you could say virgil sorry not virgil r.i.p you could say her impression you could say Pusha t you could say other people involved in the scene but they decided to pull on Balenciaga. Why? Because it hurts his pocket, hurts his reputation, and maybe affects him in a more personal way and in proxy as well, gets other people to shut up and fall in line. So I, I, I hate it. I think it's disgusting. Balenciaga, the brand whose show Ye opened on October 2nd with a surprise modeling appearance, the brand he collaborated with during his ill fated Gap adventure and whose Gap engineered by Balenciaga products can still be found on their stores. Um, the brand whose designer Demna has described texting with Ye several times a day and who attended the Yeezy show with Cedric. Charbat, um, the Balenciaga chief executive, who's not said a word about his statement, even as Ye's post and A Wars have become ever more incendiary. The final, the thing that I find really interesting about this thing, you don't get the same article from Vanessa Friedman regarding Daniel Lee basically getting his job back at Bur Burberry. You don't get her saying the same things. You don't get her calling out Burberry for hiring somebody who was accused of saying something racist behind closed doors. You don't get her questioning the appointment and whether or not they've actually done any investigation behind the claims. You don't get her questioning people in the industry who haven't said anything, zero. But when it comes to obviously getting a black man out to paint, it's a bit easier to do it. And to, especially somebody who no, they never liked in the first place, ever since her first show they did in Paris in what, 2012 or whatever, whatever it was, he's never really been liked in the industry. And he's always tried to get that adulation and love and they've been basically dancing around it and loving his wife and Kim first, really mostly before him. And it's all been a bit of an uphill struggle, but they've kind of wanted to get him out in general anyway. Um, it comes uh, up until now that I was worked. Sorry, it says here, um, as Serge Carrera, a lecturer in the luxury fashion industry at the Sciences Po University in Paris, said, the whole industry is in a way guilty of complacency. Um, but when it comes to Ye, in a thrall of his celebrity and co dependent relationship with fashion, is Balenciaga with Ye, which has conducted the most enduring affair. Up until now, that has worked in both advantages. Ye gave Balenciaga the aura of relevance and a new audience. Balenciaga provided the high fashion embrace Ye craved. Together, they became a viral sensation. For Balenciaga, however, it could turn out to be a very very dangerous liaison indeed fuck off dangerous liaison fuck off not to mention a case of study of the problems of mixing business and friendship as a desperate creative world meld into one now fair enough let's take her first statement to be correct it might turn into a dangerous thing for their business but then to go on and try to basically end their friendship between Demner and Virgil is pretty abhorrent I think personally in my opinion that she's going out of her way to basically try to put pressure on Demner to essentially end his friendship with Kanye because of what he said it's ridiculous it's literally ridiculous especially when you consider the amount of things in fashion the amount of people in fashion um, that people have basically turned a blind eye to and like I said the first thing being the most recent example being Daniel Lee who is formerly at Bottega Veneta being accused of calling somebody a fucking nigger in a meeting and now he's He's got his job back at Burberry or not job back but he's back involved in fashion he's got one of the best jobs out there in terms of resources and he's just going to go back and do things again like nothing ever happened absolutely disgusting not to mention what happened with Alexander Wang and whatever it may be nonsense the issue that is for Blanchard blaming him could be considered a, bet a betrayal to Mr. Carrera not just personally but because Ye has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and at the same time he said the silence could be perceived as support for the indefensible ideas that he's promoting no one thinks any of the brands that haven't spoken up um, about what Ye said that they are 
fucking co-signing what he said sometimes it's not for you to get involved what can you actually say well you all know being anti-semitic is absolutely abhorrent we all know bigotry is absolutely abhorrent what yay is saying is what he's saying on himself there's not been many people out there co-signing him the only people that have been co-signing him are people that the society has deemed to be deplorable and to be unlistenable anyway in terms of the you know the candace owens and stuff regular people would have never endorsed him in the slightest but we all are not naive enough to um, look past the thing of this guy is a fucking mega celebrity hence why he commands this level of attention and he clearly makes all these people business he does business with loads of money so they caught in a bit of a quagmire so to sit there and just think it's just a point of morals and principles is a nonsense is it is absolute nonsense because essentially daniel lee's been given a job back at burberry why because not because of moral and principle because of business because they know he can affect some level of change in their brand to the point where he can you know restore their good fortune maybe put some good designs back out there again and make them relevant once more so that risk is worth taking in terms of having some negative comments being left under a post on fucking diet prada they're willing to take that risk and it's a business risk it's not a risk done on principle of like oh no we're anti cancer culture no they don't care about that they just know he's a hot designer they know he had a lot of clout and a lot of energy and noise behind his name when he's that particular thing there so why not try and replicate that again at burberry especially off the back of the disastrous kind of ricardo tishi tenure those ideas most likely were Adidas that continues to an article whose almost 10 year partnership with um, Yeezy has been extraordinarily lucrative for both sides, even though this publicly criticized the company's executives. Duh, this is what you can do. When you're, when you're lucrative and you make people money, you can criticize them and say crazy shit. Um, this is what we've known. We've known this even from sports. People in sports team or players in sports teams can get up to nonsense. They can hit their partners. They can have some very funky flipping, you know, SA allegations next to their name. They can get involved in fraud and whatever maybe but if you're really talented people make excuses for you because guess what the bottom line is what happens on the pitch and how that affects the fucking stock price and the sale of shirts it's gross but it is what it is um has issued a statement of the password together but note the partnership is under review they are probably why instagram and twitter have locked years accounts while jp morgan has accused so has apparently stepped down as a youtube company's banker and why balenciaga's failure to respond is particularly striking so vanessa freeman is going out of her way to really really try to put a boot in and try to make sure that balenciaga ends any relationship that they have with this guy it's absolutely revolting to be fair this is especially so in context of the social cultural the changes continues here i can only assume many people wrong-footed or confused possibly waiting or hoping for an apology of sorts says um luca solka luxury analyst of research firm sanford and c Bernstein. but he continued this reminds me of john galliano i see one street of implication i see a one-way street of implication and it says mr galliano former audio designer who was fired after a drunken anti-semitic rant in paris bar and who was later subject to a court trial in france inciting racial hate as a crime fined and forced out of fashion until he had gone through rehabilitation and made years of amends the funny thing about this issue is also if you think about it the john galliano exile was mostly self um, inflicted if you listen to his interviews he was getting offers the entire time he was sitting on the sidelines but he didn't want to get back in because he wasn't in the right mind state and then when he was right in the back mind state guess what happened he was straight into Maison, Maison Martin Margiela one of the premier houses that you can work for one of the most talented fashion teams or artisanal people in the scene ever so it's not as if like his career suffered that badly and i'm sure whilst he was in exile and sitting on the sidelines he had many patrons who were you know ambassadors or whatever it was they were called behind the scenes making sure that he was able to pay his rent and live a somewhat comfortable life because of his talent so let's not act like people don't make exceptions for people but therein lies the rub a typical ambassadorial agreement between brands and celebrity a famous person is under contract to be the face of the label which could mean appearing in the company's advertisements or simply wearing its product on a red carpet but the person relationship between Ye and Balenciaga is really a relationship between Ye and Demna it's a complex mix of moose collaborator and, and customer fan friend and celebrity that has been stewed um for seven years it's akin to a creative romance and any sort of professional agreement that was just this is a bit funny according to one insider yeah he's been known to refer to himself as them the straight husband and as with any marriage it's possible that them the balenciaga yeah connection is so intertwined and independent that they're not sure how to disangle it the only reason why i could see that it'd be disangled not be or detangled or disentangled not because of vanessa freeman's word but more so because of what yay did when he i wouldn't say docs but he essentially went out there and basically put the balenciaga people who agreed with tremaine's post on front screen on the jumbotron by showing and highlighting all their names that's one way i can see it kind of hurting here in that regard um 
in terms of these personal relationships so maybe them could be like hey these are my people this is my family they make the brand what it is you disrespect them i can't speak to you anymore so that could put pressure on the, obviously the relationship and then off of the back of it maybe if them that has jewish people in his family and stuff that could be something that could of course affect him personally but then of course just in terms of a pure business decision it blends you to tell him hey if you don't cut ties with this guy you're out then it's a pretty easy decision to make, right? Somebody you've only known recently in your life, some like a cold, old, old school friend. They've known each other for a while, but not super, super long. But I guess it, for Kanye, it'll be really a sense of betrayal because if I'm not mistaken, Kanye was first on Demna, you know, just after his first show at Vetimo. Like just after he was working on Yeezy's season, Yeezy, sorry, season one, he helped out with that behind the scenes. It's just been around the crew from that time onward. So Kanye has been on him and known of his potential and power for a long time. So to have somebody you really think is a friend in fashion, somebody as high up and as talented as he is, to basically disavow you is pretty glim. I think so in that regard. So I'm not going to read the entire article itself, but this is basically Vanessa Freeman trying her best to bury the guy. The funny thing is, if you actually go on the Blanchard collection show, you'll see that the first, Im this is kind of working out first. This first image is completely gone. I'm not sure if this means this whole outfit is going to get pushed in the front or thrown in the bin, but this first look that Kanye wore with the mouth guard and a hat and a weird and whatever, that tactical vest, tactical jacket is completely gone. They've deleted it entirely from any court of record. So he's not, he's not appearing on there. So clearly there's a, some Something happening behind the scenes that's happening and something people have realized too that some of the easy gap stuff has been taken off the website as well so clearly there's an issue going on there behind the scenes so let's see what happens with that going forward not really too sure what's going to transpire but i hate this article i hate people kind of advocating for people to lose their jobs um even if what Kanye said was completely abhorrent and crazy and something that i obviously don't condone in the slightest to go out there out of your way to basically force somebody to end a relationship with somebody is kind of gross because i don't think this happens to anybody else like i said if this applies to all people then i'm for it but i don't see the same article for daniel lee i don't see the same article for alexander wang and various other people in fashion who've done abhorrent things and i think it's completely unfair but maybe that's just me maybe that's just me maybe that's just me duh, 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 duh. anyway so that is Action Zero Show, episode number 611. Just a quick one to kind of get your attention. If it's your first time watching the show, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. And I'll see you guys again very soon. Of course, you listen to the audio podcast, you'll hear my tune of the day. If you're watching it via YouTube, you won't hear jack crap. It'll just fade to black. So, peace. <laughs>